Thank you for listening to Knocking Doors Down, brought to you by KDD Media Company. Support for Knocking Doors Down is brought to you by Manscaped. Who's the best in men's below-the-waist grooming? Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code KDD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. And use the code KDD. Your balls will thank you. Inside the 5150 Studios, this is Knocking Doors Down. Your host, Jason Lachance. I have struggled with alcoholism, gone through a divorce, some childhood trauma, including some sexual abuse and other adversities. But hey, taking that, turning it into an advantage, just like my co-host, Mr. Mikey Naraki. Hi, everyone. And uh, of course, that's what Knocking Doors Down is all about. We've spoken to so many different people of so many different backgrounds of struggle, not just addiction, mental health issues, physical health issues. Of course, all that stuff can play on it. And, um, you know, everything from even losing a loved one Mm -hmm. due to addiction or health issues. So we've had a heck of a first year. Uh, that's included some conversations with people I never thought we would speak with. Same. And, and uh, let alone that, uh, including traveling from- or going uh, to houses I never thought I'd be at their houses, like I, Bam Margera, what the fuck? Yeah, I was talking with a friend about this, and I was telling them, you know, they were asking, do you still get starstruck? Uh, and I'm like, no, mm. uh, not really, but what I do get, is especially for Caitlyn Jenner, mm-hmm. she welcomed us into her home. Bam Margera welcomed us into his home, Castle Bam. My thing was more about these people are welcoming us into their home. I don't want to be disrespectful of their home, their time, and how, you know, everything. That was more my concern than being like starstruck. As it wasn't so much, wow, we're at Caitlyn Jenner's house, which was very gracious. Or we're at Castle Bam, which was very gracious. It was more of, I don't want to disrespect their home, setting up equipment. Like, we're going to put this here, and we're going to put that there. You're it's telling like, me, bro. I was <laughs> on the phone with April Margera when we were sitting out front of the house, and she was walking me through how to get into the house. And I'm just like, is anybody home? Because Bam doesn't live there. Yeah. Bam lives five miles up the road. <laughs> so I didn't know that. So I just thought he was, like, gone, like, fucking grocery shopping or right. something. And... She was instructing me let, on let how me to get in. Let me paint it for the pi- picture, people. By the way, hey, this uh, this episode, it's just, it's, it's you know, this is Christmas Eve when this has come out. It's uh, getting to know the host, Mikey and myself. And so what Mikey's talking about is we pull up to Castle Bam, and we're at the gate. We don't know how to get in. We got in through the uh, gate. I, I, we yeah. got to get in the gate. Well, initially, we don't know how to get in because there's no one there. We, we get sent a number from our contact that helps us book our guests, and she goes, call this number, and you're like, holy shit, it's April Margera. So here you are on the phone with April Margera. Carry on. Thank you. So I'm on the phone with April Margera and Ape, as people who watch Viva La Bam and Jackass and all that, and I'm already just like, this is super surreal talking to her, and... You know, she's walking me through how to get into the home and all this stuff. And she was just like, Mikey, the house is yours, like, for the day. You do whatever you guys need to do, set up wherever you need to set up. Bam's going to be there in about 10 minutes. So you guys just do your thing. And I'm sitting here like... <laughs> like I re- is it okay if I use the restroom and she was like sweetie you gotta stop this is your house for the day you do whatever you gotta do and I'm just like this is so surreal because I don't get starstruck either um, I lived in Hollywood for about a year and you know I worked at a very popular sushi restaurant there were celebs coming in and out all the time it was just it was cool to see them but I wasn't like oh my gosh look who it is but it was just so surreal being in that house right because I loved Viva La Bam as a kid so being in that house seeing where all oh this is where that happened oh that's where that happened that part of it wall. was just so gnarly like wow I'm literally in my TV set at 16 years old yeah you know and it yeah. was just so surreal being there I, I I don't really know how to explain it like it was just I felt like I even said it in the interview like I felt like I need to do something I need to like jump off the stair set or punch Jason in the nuts I gotta do <laughs> something jackass hey Jason go will. sit or on just, the shitter like like Phil and yeah. let me beat the crap out. I'm Mikey and this is the nut punch and then just s- drill him in the nuts. But you know, just something like that. But th- th- it's just a weird experience. So I, stoked to be there, but a weird yeah. experience. Well, and I get it, you know, because our thing is about 
you know, we want to inspire all of you through these conversations, e- even if you're not a person that's struggled with addiction, mental health, uh, physical health, losing a loved one to a, a physical ailment or addiction or whatever it is. And that's, you know, the people that we talk to that have been amazing over the course of our, our first, well, under a full calendar year, our first calendar year of, of production of the Knocking Doors Down podcast, just at that opportunity, because, you know, when we started this thing, and, and at first I was by myself, I wouldn't have thought that these opportunities would come about, and they're, you know, they're most certainly aren't um, treated without uh, the utmost gratitude. You know, we've mm-hmm. got support not only from, from the boss man, Carlos Vieira, that's not said no to anything that maybe seemed crazy to us, which is ironically also within that 5150 lifestyle of his there's you know it's like go after it if you want to make it happen make it happen you know and have faith in us that you know our support staff miss elsa genie um you know chris uh that marino that people have heard on here our, our marketing guy jason and and so it's it's just been this this crazy kind of thing to sit and think when it when we started this out and we were just trying to get some momentum that it's like if you had told us we will. You're going to go from L.A. to Philadelphia and back in eight days. And you're not only going to do that, you're going to Caitlyn Jenner's house. Then you're going to talk to Mike this situation. With a five-hour layover in yeah. Chicago. <laughs> hey, we made the best of it. Yeah. And then uh, Bam Margera and Brandon Novak at Castle Bam, plus all these other great interviews. And you're going to talk to Bam's mom first to right. get all this situated. Yeah. yeah. And, and all these other great interviews that we've had, um, you know, of course, due to COVID, primarily via Zoom, understandably, uh, but a lot of great in-house guests that we've had come through that, you know, the, the the whole thing that when this started out was this idea of just hope, you know, to coin Michael Jordan, if you ever watched the Last Dance uh, documentary like Mikey and myself watched way too many times at the way end, he said, he, you know, his whole thing with building the Bulls was hope. It was about hope. And that's what this has been. And it kind of helps me selfishly unselfish to quote Kobe Bryant continue to build that hope and momentum as we continue to do these things that I just I wouldn't have imagined possible so more or less this episode can be about us right yeah Yeah, no guess it's about us so Jason what was a young Jason like what was it what was a young I know we've heard bits and pieces of it throughout the episodes but you grew up like before Monterey I was born in Salinas, and I grew up in a little town called Aromas on a like a ranch property that my parents had. My dad oh, had his trucking. Bastard. My dad had his trucking company there. Um, you know, my parents were really young when they got married. My dad literally was seventeen. His mom had to sign the marriage license. I believe my mom was twenty one or twenty two. Yeah, my dad was that studly. Um, you know. Gorgeous lady. Kind of reminds me of your parents. You know, it's like yeah. your mom, a gorgeous lady. My mom, And then my dad, lady. fucking Shrek over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> my mom's sweet little Hispanic lady. And then you got my dad, big ass six foot five white boy coming in like, who the fuck? Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, a, a weird kid. Um, never felt like I fit in. So mm-hmm. a lot of our guests that talk about that, um, you know, shy. I was, believe it or not, really short. I had a huge, huge, huge growth spurt. It was like 13, 14 inches in just over a year and a half. Um, But I found that growing up in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, I had close friends, but they were miles and miles away, as a lot of people in kind of rural areas, that humor became such an important thing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the only time if (laughs) if I was kind of a jackass, so to speak, and doing stupid stuff that uh, that it was like people kind of noticed me. I didn't feel comfortable talking about thoughts or emotions. Do you guys have like parks and shit? Where I, I didn't need a park, man. We we were on acres and acres of property. We had goat carts and our oh, our, okay, our bikes okay. and all that shit. And our, our you know my dad hauled aggregates, so dirt for people that don't know, and rock and stuff. So we had you know dirt piles and and. And I really grew up in that that era of you know the the people that came out of the you know the Dust Bowl, the Great Depression. That was my parents' parents too. My parents were really thriving. My mm-hmm. dad and mom were both always so, no matter what, incredibly hardworking. And my dad, of course, he struggled with addiction, which I've talked about here. And uh, there, I, I, 
I'm going to try to take you up north to meet my family, and I think we're going to have a talk with my dad because you want a story. It's, it's a fucking story, and he's ready to tell it. With addiction, do you are you like uh, substance abuse, alcohol, all the above? Uh, my dad drank, and I remember, and my mom did too, but she never got shit housed. She mm-hmm. was good about having a drink or two at most that Same I recall. With Same with mine. Whereas my dad, yeah, there was times I remember a story. Uh, not a story. I remember it. Uh, my mom was pissed off one night and I want to say it was near the end of the year. Dad went out with buddies or whatever. He had this black Ford F-150 and my dad always had such pride, took immaculate care of everything, like his tools. If you didn't put a fucking tool back, oh yeah, you got your ass chewed out. Mm -hmm. Um, So he had passed out in his pickup truck. So clearly he had done the stupid thing of drinking and driving. You know, people were more ignorant in the 80s. They just were, Mm -hmm. So you know. Um, and it was a stormy night. So my mom opened the doors on his pickup truck. And of course it rained that night. Uh, you know, so shit like that, right. you know, like looking back and not realizing like, fuck, there was a lot of chaos. So did you ever see that? And as a kid and be like, damn, I'm never doing that. Or did it not really? It didn't dawn on me. Okay. Didn't dawn on me. There mm-hmm. was many other occasions too, where, you know, I know my dad tried to connect with me, but I think because I was so different, like my brother, you know, my brother was into the go-kart racing with my dad. Here I was kind of my mom's, you know, she was really loves baseball to this day. So I was actually an outstanding baseball player until I had my growth spurt, lost all coordination, got into basketball. Um, and I did sports to stay out of trouble and with my friends because mm-hmm. I knew there was shit about me that... Like there was a propensity to just kind of not be afraid of stuff. Mm-hmm. Ironically, I just, I didn't get hurt um, much, it, you know, um, like I've talked about like my car accident when I was married where, I, you know, two or three beers in me, but I went off the road thing. The guy is like, you know, who died in this? And I walked away, you know, mm-hmm. I've kind of always had that thing. Cause of course I say this and then something terrible is going to happen, but I, I kind of, I wouldn't say I was a crazy daring daring kid, but I also wasn't afraid at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, even though shy, once I got to talking, I was incredibly loud, didn't have a filter, um, and oftentimes used humor or character voices to hide what I really had to say mm-hmm. uh, and what I felt. Um, always felt disconnected, uh, <laughs> you know, the 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 girl that you wanted wasn't the girl that you got the girl that you got wasn't the girl that you wanted kind of stuff throughout it, your whole life or uh no no but but i i realized that was kind of some ego thing because mm-hmm. it was like well i want this person to like me and i couldn't accept anyone liking or loving me from early on which i still struggle with mm-hmm. sadly but uh, yeah a weird kid uh, you know lots of saturday night live i was dana carvey was everything you know doing the church lady in in class you know um i mean what the fuck else is there to do uh, yeah <laughs> Mo- mocking teachers mocking my fellow students to a certain extent she's trying to get people to laugh right right you know thinking that you know that that was the path uh you know when people are into pop music i was into heavy metal punk music rap and all this shit that you shouldn't be and um you know it was Looking back, there was chaos. What does it say? There was moments where now looking back, I realize it was my dad coming down. You know, crank was his thing. Mm -hmm. Truck driver, it's common. I'm not saying all truck drivers out there do it, but I'm saying at at that time, in that era, it was common. Mm -hmm. My dad would work two or three days. My dad, you know, and we'll talk about when we have that conversation, hopefully with him of, you know, coming from a shit situation, never having a home, always moving all the time. Uh, you know, throughout his life, his parents were chaos. You know, I realized he did all those things in his own mind and to rationalize it to make sure my brother and I and my mom always had like a home. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of shit. I mean, you know, if you've ever watched the show, The Goldbergs, where Adam has like all the G.I. Joe toys, all the He-Man, that was me. Well, yeah, I mean, go-karts in itself, those aren't cheap. Mm -mm. So, you know, having all that kind of stuff, I would imagine you've had some stuff. What, um, when... So when you were in high school, let's go to mm-hmm. high school, for example, was alcohol, did that come into play then? Or were you kind of college nope. drinker? I was the guy that got the drunk girl home. Oh, you were that guy. Yeah. Okay. I, I, Which is great. Yeah. Because I saw, 
I saw that by the time high school hit and I was driving, I knew it was going on with my dad. Rehabs had started for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, the tumultuous nature of my parents' stuff. And, and, and one thing, too, that really affected me in childhood, and you can go back, make a pinpoint, my mom had cancer mm-hmm. a couple of times. Um, and that really affected me a lot as a kid, too. Sure. That was my rock, and here it was, seeing my mom... This hardworking, beautiful, honest woman, shirt off your back, would do anything, was kind of like the den mother for so many kids that still to this day, I can't believe your mom took us to do this or that or, you know, to see her, you know, she could have died. Mm-hmm. Um, really fucked me up, and I didn't really actually realize that until maybe a month or two ago because I've started through, you know, through with recovery. I've not really had those deep conversations with my parents, mm-hmm. and I have started where mm-hmm. it's not just our 10-minute check-in conversations. I'm talking two, three, three-and-a-half-hour conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, anyways, we can go back to that if you want. No, high school, I was a guy that got, got the girls home. Uh, only time I can think of having alcohol was maybe my cousin's wedding, is, you know, toast of champagne. So when did all of it start for you? Because obviously that was your addiction, alcohol. Yep. So high school, you were the guy who got everyone home safely, which I'm sure – for the people like me who partied and needed to get home safely, we are appreciative <laughs> for the people like you. When did it start hitting the bottle pretty heavy? I want to say really why I think that was too. Not only was I showing up to guys that I looked up to, but I was seeing them inebriated. Mm-hmm. And then I was seeing the situation, and I'm not saying that any of these individuals, be it female or male, were also confused as teenagers, but then I would see them inebriated making bad choices and then they would come to me afterwards, I can't believe I slept with this person. Mm-hmm. Well, you're drunk at this party. So I kind of, once I started going to any sort of parties, I just kind of became that guy. Like even, it wasn't just female friends, it was male friends. Like, dude, I messed up and, you know, Susie X wants to hook up. It's like, do you really want to hook up? I don't know, man, I'm horny. It's like, you're not making a rational decision. Let's get some water and just fucking pass out or whatever, dude. Uh-huh. Like, you know. I just didn't want to be that guy. Um, and despite what we've talked about, the sexual trauma that I went through, the, you know, an incident of molestation, early exposure to pornography, I still had a thing inside me despite being a horny teenager that I wanted some sort of intimacy, mm-hmm. which is still a struggle to this day. Um, but uh, so drinking, when did it start? <sighs> It wasn't initially in college because I went to Arizona State, mm-hmm. which was a party school, and even then I still didn't like. I was so you were a very late bloomer. Yeah. Oh yeah. So I was clueless to so many things. I'm the only guy that ever dated a stripper that didn't have sex with her. Yeah, you know? that like, still doesn't make any fucking sense. I just, to me. I, you know, I remember it, and it was a funny story because I go to her place and she's like, "What are we drinking tonight?" And I go, "Well, you know how old I am." She goes, "Oh, don't worry about it," you know. And so we go, and she's grabbing, like, a case of beer and a thing of vodka, and I grab, like, an Arnold Palmer, which for people that don't know is lemonade and iced tea, and here she is just hammered. And I'm, she's like, well, have a beer, relax. And I'm just like, I fucking couldn't. And what age was that? 19, 18, 19. Okay, so out of college. Yeah. I'm still trying to get to when the fuck you started drinking. <laughs> oh. So, no, it was in college. Um, I bounced around to a few schools, Arizona to San Francisco. Arizona came back home, got some degrees in photography and some other stuff, went to San Francisco, hated it, didn't get along, just didn't connect with anyone. It wasn't that I didn't get along, just didn't connect with anyone. And then I ended up in Monterey at the film school there. Nice. Started making friends and, and working some odd jobs, and people were going out partying, and then I... You know, I would have a beer or two and I was good, you know, go out dancing with, you know, hey, it was cool. All of a sudden here it is. It's like, fuck, six or seven chicks. Guys don't want to dance. I'll fucking dance. I don't care if I look like a fool because they're having fun with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I would say it kind of started taking off, was out one night. The way I got into radio broadcasting was uh, friends band playing cracking some jokes guy says you're funny you want to work in radio i say you want to buy me a a jack and coke and he's like yeah and so then you know radio kind of started interning and uh being out in the public people start to recognize you i started to become a little uncomfortable so i found with you know two or three jack and cokes which was my drink at the time or uh you know as a big big rum guy was another one of my things that at that point 
started to loosen up. Mm -hmm. And it was probably until about 22, my 21st birthday, I shared a six pack of MGD with my grandpa because that was his thing, my cousin and myself. Mm -hmm. My 22nd birthday was some other shit that I can't recall for you, so don't ask. Other shit, like meaning harder alcohol or? Oh yeah, harder alcohol. Hooked up with someone that night. Couldn't tell you her name. Don't recall. Oh, well, sure. We've been there. Gone the next day kind of a situation. So it really started there when, when radio started. Because mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you're doing this thing. And what age was that? 22. Oh, okay, 22. Yeah, twenty between 21 and 22 I started. So you're doing this thing now. Shy kid. Only comfortable in characters. But they're wanting you to be yourself. And you're talking to people. And then people are starting to recognize who you are. Mm-hmm. When you go out. Or... We would do ticket giveaways. You could get away with this shit in radio. And some chick would go, hey, I'll come down and get topless. What? All right. Uh, send us a picture. Then they would send you a picture. This was like when AOL Messenger was a thing. You're like, shit, yeah, come on down. And some gal gets topless for you in the studio. And then they're talking to you. And they're like, hey, you want to go for a drink later that night? That just that all just sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it, it, it does, it, it, and it was fun. Of course. And so I'm starting to like finally feel like, okay, I'm cool. I'm in a social crowd. I'm a, I'm a leader in some ways. People want to hear what I have to say. My voice is now valid. I'm not just the person that sits there quietly. Um, I'm, you know, and I've had high school friends debate this and say, no, bullshit. You were, you know. You were a popular guy. You're the, I just kind of got along with everyone. Sure. But it's all self-image, right? Yeah. All self-perception. <clears throat> so, yeah, <throat> once that started taking off, then you're hanging out with rock stars, and, you know, they're like, hey, come hang out with us afterwards. And, you know, you go from just having some booze to, you know, people are passing a joint around, and, you know, you're in the college life. You're doing that. You're partying. You're out meeting chicks, and mm-hmm. there you go. But it didn't get chaotic at that point. So it turned into a habit because you're in radio, you're partying with all these different people, and... It started to become a little routine in that you go to a concert, right, you're going to have a couple drinks sure. or whatever. And there's many times I was the DD of the group, right. you know, of people that would go to the concerts or whatever it was, or out for the night. But I would say, yeah, that's when the first, like, bad hangovers, getting sick, drinking so much, you're throwing up. Yeah. All that shit really started. So, but you think normal, typical college shit, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what you think of generally: college parties, girls, all that good stuff. So, what I want to ask you is: at what point did it start to get chaotic? And during that point, did you know, okay, shit's starting to get out of hand? It started to get chaotic when I moved to the area we live in now in mm-hmm. Central California, working in radio, and. Radio was still, when this happened, you were a little nard still. I was just a little nard dog. Yeah. Uh, um, radio was still one of the few mediums. There wasn't streaming services of any kind or anything else. So now you're in a small town doing this morning show. We would literally, my co-host and I, we could go out on a Thursday night, and it could be between us a $150 bill, and we never paid. Mm-hmm. And so now people are wanting to hang out with you, and it's a small town thing. People are bored. What do they do? They're not doing creative shit. We're not getting together, you know, d- taking a painting class. You're going out. You're getting drunk. You're doing that whole thing. And, you know, that's really kind of – it was It was still fun at that point. And then when I met my kid's mom, you know, that's kind of when things started to change. It was just – we had an age gap. Mm-hmm. She's, you know, gorgeous lady, you know, but she was – a young lady, very mm-hmm. young at the time, wasn't even. I didn't even... realize how much younger than she was than you until I think you and I, because I we had always known who each other was. Yeah. And you know we'd it would be very like high and by or when we see each other, dude, what's going on? How you been? Blah blah blah. But until we started working together, I didn't realize the age gap because you don't look your age. Well, for, thank you. Yeah, for those who don't know, Jason's, I'm the young buck in this studio. <laughs> but um, so yeah, what is the age gap between you two? Seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. Okay. Yeah. So she was probably nineteen, s- and I was twenty six. So she so. was in her party phase then. Yeah, she's you know that transitioning into college yeah, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Lost, not knowing what to do, and 
Uh, you know, we just got, we connected on a lot of things. It's funny. We talk about BAM. That was one of her, our shows that we would sit, watch it on her parents' couch with her brother and, you know, we're having cocktails or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, we're both and Mikey always jokes about this cause we get along very well for a so divorce couple. Weird. <laughs> very well. Now it's taken a lot of work, a lot of healing. Uh, and it still has its challenges. Did she clean your house one time when we were gone? You and I were gone, and she was like watching the kids. They're divorced, and she was cleaning your house. I'm like, what the fuck is the matter with you guys? It's just so weird to me. Uh, well, we do what we can to be there so that our kids. I have guess a, that have explains the, the past life. with my exes, right? It's so <laughs> fucking weird to me. I would never clean my ex's house. If Are you we didn't me? have, if we didn't have kids, we probably wouldn't know each other. But we do. So right, we, we've right. done the work to heal as the best we can as individuals and make sure we're there for our kids. But, well, uh, that's good. That's good. But it's yeah. weird to me, but that's great for you guys and great for the kids. Sure. Let me just clear that up. Sure. So, you know, the best I could break it down, and maybe one day she can come and tell her side or something that might be interesting to folks, is that she was young. She's trying to find her place in the world, and here I am, this guy heading towards, you know, his mid-20s, heading towards 30s, kind of want that love lockdown. Here it is. And she was, you know, this hot chick. And now she's just now figuring herself out. And so it really caused a lot of chaos. Mm -hmm. And I think it was as if you people that haven't heard an episode look back. Tony Hoffman, look that one up. It's really good if you want something really intellectually and informed about addiction was a lot of trauma bonding. Sure. That, that she and I had a lot of trauma You're bonding. You're comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And we would. And it was... Best I could put it, like when things were good, it was like like a fucking supernova exploding. It looks beautiful, but chaos occurred, mm -hmm. and it you know, and I think we kind of became addicted to each other. We'd get away from each other and then come back and away and come back, and you know. I'm assuming that was probably in the pinnacle of the chaotic antics with drinking. Um, no, oh. because then along came parenthood. Mm -hmm. So we ended up and we had two amazing, beautiful children. But within that marriage was still a lot of that underlining stuff. And we didn't have the coping mechanisms. And so we would convince ourselves that, hey, when things were cool and, you know. And so, if, no, for me, it really took off and got at its worst within that time. Gotcha. And then the marriage ended. Did you realize that at the time when it was at its worst? Did you know? I, I got clean within the marriage for a while. Oh, and okay. I was trying to lead by example. She support that? Uh, at the time? No. Well, you at know, not time. a lot of people can understand it. And again, keep in mind, she's younger at this point. Yeah. She became a mom at 21. So she had to grow up fast. Yeah. And so, you know, two people, not the best coping skills, coping skills the best communication skills, um, you know, leverage as opposed to love um, within the relationship and stuff like that. And again, I played my part in it, so I'm not pointing fingers any one way or the other, but then the chaos ensued and started and yeah. And then, uh, you know, really wanting out of it. I know we both wanted out of it. And, and then the uh, incident with the car accident occurs and that mm -hmm. was kind of the antithesis towards the end. And, um, you know, she was, we were both ready to move along and she moved along and here it was divorce papers and now figuring out that. And even then after that, after the divorce, no, I was still, still drinking, yeah. still, still partying, but it wasn't like a frequent thing. Were you drinking because of the divorce or just Absolutely. because you had just had a good time doing it? Absolutely. Oh, okay. It, it started to become a thing that the only way I could relax, have a good time, uh, with people, let alone try to, um, talk and get to know a female again, mm -hmm. alcohol had to be involved. Support for Knocking Doors Down is brought to you by Manscaped. Who's the best in men's below-the-waist grooming? Manscaped, they offer precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Hey, Mikey, you ever, like, cut your face when you're shaving and then you got to do the little, like, pin thing or put the tissues on it? Oh, yeah, a little piece of toilet paper there. Wouldn't you want to avoid that for your Johnson? Because we don't want to have any cuts, nicks, scratches, or scrapes. Well, that's happened before, and let me tell you, it's the fucking worst. <laughs> there is nothing worse. But uh, it would be even worse to have that tissue on your sack if you nicked yourself. That's right. You want to impress that significant other and be all groomed and trimmed and ready to go whenever hibbity-dibbity starts. Their third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. That's right. And check it out. If you're listening to me speak right now, I want you to experience it firsthand for yourself. All right, let's get that bush to tush clean. Rooter to the tutor. 
Get 20% off free shipping with the code KDD at manscaped.com. Make your testies their besties. That's right. And when I tell you it is premium, I mean premium. The battery lasts up to 90 minutes so you can take a longer shave. Waterproof technology allows you to groom in the shower. Plus, it's got an LED light. How cool is that? Which illuminates grooming areas for a closer and more precise trimming. Well, they've also upgraded to a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology, so that ain't half bad, Jason. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code KDD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code KDD. Your balls will thank you. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know... Like Raj from Big Bang Theory, you need drinks to talk to a woman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had to have liquid courage. Well, exactly. And liquid courage is a real thing. Like you could be, you know, sober as a judge shopping at, you know, whatever supermarket and you see a hot chick and it's kind of like, uh, but you know, you got a few Jack and Cokes in you and you're at the bar and you're just like, hey, what up, girl? Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's go in the. Uh, See, I was a strong, silent type. I would sit at the end of the bar and ignore the shit out of people that eventually. Like, even a buddy of mine, we would joke about that. I'd be like, no, I'm not talking to anyone tonight. Just just give me a pitcher of beer, and I'll sit at the end of the bar. See, I don't understand that either. If you don't want to talk to anybody, then just drink at home. That's what I never I understood. Wa- because he was, like, one of my best friends, so I wanted to talk to him. Yeah. But then by the end of the night, sure as shit, here I am. Of and course. Then, you got you know, the liquid courage in you. You got the liquid courage. Yeah. Well, and somebody's coming up to me, and all right, and you know, and... um. So no, it, it, it continued afterwards because of that car accident. I I had probation. I had to be on an ankle monitor for, uh, it, it was really shortened, uh, right. but it was scary. I had to go to court. I was in there. They were wanting to throw the book at me. They were wanting to make an example. Um, you know, even my lawyer, I was like, they do understand I didn't call from the car because my car accident was maybe a quarter of a mile from my house. Mm-hmm. I didn't call because my phone was thrown from my car. Mm-hmm. You know, cops found it hours later. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was covered in fucking dirt and thistles in my foot because I was wearing flip flops. One of them got lost. I said, they do realize I walked home to call from there because I couldn't find and my phone. And not flee the scene. You and, didn't flee the scene. No. That's what that's, you were trying, the yeah. point you were trying to Judge get Judge didn't care. Yeah. And so they, you know, an example um and i took it to heart um you know and but i still struggled yeah i still struggled there wasn't uh well even where we sit right now you're sober but i'm sure every day's oh yeah not necessarily a struggle but it's not easy no there's it's 24 hours at yeah. a time yeah i break it down that way now i just break down you know life by goal uh-huh. like the result i want so the result is I want to be sober today. It's not just this hour. So if I break it down to today as opposed to every second, every minute, every hour, mm-hmm. just means, okay, I got through another day sober. Cool. Right. I'm good. Right. I'm good. But right. uh, yeah, no, it didn't, even after that though, even after all that, it, it didn't stop. It took it took a lot. I actually went, uh, you know, ended up with another long-term relationship that uh, poor gal, you know, did her best, you know, as everyone does, but also- you know young but eventually that also came off the rails too because i couldn't organize my personal life i couldn't organize my work life i couldn't organize single parenthood and so that relationship suffered severed same kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so the pattern continued to repeat and then i was able to get almost two years sober and then um my best friend's mom who i had known since i was three it was just an angel to me. My family had done so much. I could go on and on for too long. Um, unexpectedly died in advance uh, case of sepsis and lost her and, you know, fell off. And mm-hmm. it took me about another month and a half to kind of get it back together. And then, you know, prior to this had fallen off again. And mm-hmm. so, you know, still a struggle. Yeah, it's still a struggle. And uh, one of our past guests, Chris Opinski, he actually gave you a book, right? A book on that? or I, He gave me a blue book. I didn't have the big book anymore. An AA book. AA book. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's on so, my bedside, on my stand. Right I was going to say, so that's probably another support system, too, is having that. And, and I'm reaching out to people now. I'm sure. getting better about it. Sure. I'm getting better about it, like who I can talk to, which everyone needs, because we all want connectivity. You think about it. Yeah, we all want to be heard. You're wanting to go, yeah. Uh, you're wanting to go out. You're wanting to talk to people. You're wanting, you know, you're wanting to know that you're attractive to whomever you want to be attractive to. Right. You know, whatever right. your sexual orientation is, or that you're valid in what you're doing. That you're, you're, you have a value to 
not just your workplace, but your but society, your family, yourself, everything else that your life has some sort of meaning. And and for me, it was just so easy to get lost up in in the fact of. And Carlos Vieira, of course, author of the Knock the Doors Down book that started this all, talked about it was when you're in like that psychosis of it, you don't know how to go, what is me, what is life without this substance? Mm-hmm. And so it's still now to this day, speaking with all these people, which sometimes it triggers anxieties and moments, uh, you know, what am I still without this substance? And it's still a, a motherfucker to figure it out at times. Yeah. No, and it definitely uh, does trigger anxieties. I mean, I've I've struggled with anxiety for about, probably 11 years now i i thought i was dying at the time i didn't know what the fuck was going on with me i thought i was like having a heart attack or something but yeah it's been about 11 years now and we'll be talking to people to this day and they'll say something and it's not for those of you that have it you understand why i'm pausing and don't really know what to say because it's hard to explain it some people can't breathe and have you know straight up pass out you know or just have like an elephant sitting on your chest or something like that but for me my head feels like it's too heavy for my neck I feel like I'm dizzy but not dizzy to the point where it makes me nauseous dizzy to where I feel like almost lightheaded or faint and sometimes the guests will say something and I'm just I I can kind of feel I think you've even caught on a couple times where like it kind of I need to like take a step roll up my sleeves you know kind of you know, take a couple deep breaths or something like that. But yeah, it triggers it. It triggers it. And it's definitely scary because it's not, it's not something that goes away. That's the cards you were dealt. You just got to learn how to deal with it. Yeah. So that's something I'm still trying to find is how to deal with it right now. My technique is to just get up, walk around, splash cold water in my face or something like that. But it's definitely a process. Well, and it's, it, it is, and it's changing the way that you because our brains and the way we work, we are such creatures of habit and pattern. And when we fall into these things that work, like addiction, you know, and as Brandon Novak, you know, he said it so well, um, until it doesn't work anymore. And so it's, you know, it's A, dropping the thing that had worked, realizing it doesn't work anymore, and it's going to kill you as far as addiction goes. And trying to formulate new good positive habits and it's uncomfortable and it's a realization that life life isn't about seeking comfort per se it's about how you deal with the discomforts and those fleeting moments and really just kind of rationalize shit in 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 a more clear way and keep a more clear head and not overreacting and not underreacting at the same time Mm -hmm. um you know yeah so for you what kind of when you because, you, you know, we used to talk about you struggle with cocaine. Of course, you're, you know, you're kind of like me. You were into rebellious stuff, the punk rock scene, skateboarding and all those things. And for you, where did like it kind of take off and just go like, ah, oh, fuck this shit, uh, you know? Well, let me rewind back even further. So when I was a young fella, um, skateboarding was my thing. I picked up a skateboard probably around 11 or 12 years old. And unlike skateboarding now, it's very in to be sober. Sure. Like I'm seeing a lot of articles on different skateboard sites where they have skateboarders who I once idolized as a kid who are now sober and are advocates for, you know, coconut water and right. stretching, yoga, working out, all that, which is awesome for the kids nowadays who idolize these same guys. But when I grew up, there was I can give you movies specifically Baker 2G with the Baker team. Those were my, I loved them. They were my role models, Andrew Reynolds, Jim Greco, Eric Ellington. And that whole video consisted of them partying just nonstop, you know, leather jackets with no shirts on, girl pants. Like I did all that shit, skateboarding and whatnot. And I looked up to those dudes. So when we would go out, I would drink, I probably started drinking summer going into my freshman year in high school. And... Going into my freshman year in high school, I just... Sorry to cut you now, but you, you didn't... You, I mean, I've met your parents awesome, but you didn't have any, like, traumas, though, right? No, 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 no. Okay. I, my upbringing was my parents were and still are the best parents ever. Like, I I have zero complaints about them. 
took away my skateboards sometimes, <laughs> but I, I was it. I was smart though because my they said you can go do whatever you want. You just can't have your skateboard. You're grounded from your skateboard, but you can go do whatever you want. So I had another skateboard set up in my buddy's car. <sighs> so when he would pick me up, we would go skate in that board. So I had two boards. But no, so sneaky little yeah. Sense of- Going into high school, my sister was a senior and I was a freshman. So a lot of the dudes who were trying to get at my sister would kiss my ass. So they would take me to parties and stuff like that. And they were the cool seniors and whatnot, you know, trying to get in good with the little brother. So all my friends were like, how the fuck do you know that guy? How the fuck do you know this guy? So we would go to parties and whatnot with these older guys And what do we do to try to impress the older crowd, which also had the older senior girls there. And they would see, you know, us, just these little ass kids. How old was I, freshman? Like 14 years old, something like that. You know, so we were just drinking and it, it wasn't, it was whatever. Like there was weed, all that stuff. And it just, it wasn't really, it wasn't nothing. And then I would see certain friends right around junior or senior year, pull out cocaine and that scared the shit out of me that scared the shit out of me because it was like everything you had ever been warned about in high school as far as drugs you knew alcohol Mm. was inevitable you were going to try that well i did at least i'm not speaking on behalf of everybody but when i saw cocaine for the first time it scared the shit out of me i was just like oh my gosh there it is you know and i never thought i would try it but then again as I got older, I still continued to skateboard, but I was also and still am into rock and roll, Guns N' Roses in particular. I loved Guns N' Roses. So drugs and all that was there. So yeah. like these are your role models. These are who you idolize are these people who are just, you know, constantly doing lines, partying at strip clubs, hammered ass drunk. Yeah, Nikki Six and Motley Crue. Yeah. Right. So it was just it's constantly on your mind and whatnot. So I fast forward a little bit because I didn't do any of that in high school, but I drank. We drank a lot in high school. We partied all the time. It wasn't nothing, you know, going to school high and whatnot. It was just, it's just what you did. You know what I mean? Like, this is it was your circle. It was our circle. That's how we did. But it seemed like that's what everybody did. Like, even because I was, I was very social. I never felt like I didn't fit in because I was always able to talk to somebody. Like, I, I didn't know a stranger. Still to this day, I don't know a stranger. I can meet a random person on the street and just pick up a conversation with them. Never met them before in my life. So going back to that, it was just, I never felt like I was at a place. I remember one kid, I was walking to class with him and he was just like, how do you know everybody, Mikey? And I'm just like, I don't know. I just talk to people. I'm just not shy. It is what it is. So going from there into college, I wanted to get away from all that because I sucked at school. I sucked at school. So I went to a junior college away from the town that I grew up in because I wanted to get away from people that I knew and really kind of, you know, figure yourself figure out, outside shit of that out group. academically. Yeah. So I did that and I would stay after class. I would do everything I could. And I, it just wasn't for me. Yeah. So I'm not saying I'm stupid. I'm not saying I'm dumb, even though others probably will. It's fine. Um, I, it just wasn't for me. Academics is hard, dude. I went to college. It's hard. I went to, as long as I went to college, I should have had a doctorate. Okay. Yeah. It took yeah. me a long fucking time. I'm just, I'm like you. I'm so ADD. This that- is my segment, dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to relate. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so yeah. So anyways, I went to the junior college and I, I drop out just sounds so intense, but right. I didn't necessarily drop out. I just stopped going. <laughs> I remember, dude. I'll wait, never forget wait, it. Wait, 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 shelter that. You, know you dropped saying? out. You... I didn't drop out. I just yeah, stopped going. It. And I was sitting before I did that, dude. I'm sitting in the library and we had to do this, write the paper about this, submit it here and then do that. And I'm like, what the f- I don't know what any of that means. I remember just sitting back in the chair and being like, fuck. And then I looked at the dude next to me. I didn't know who he was. And I was just like, do you ever just feel like you just don't belong? And then he was typing. You just hear And then he stopped up and looked at me and was like, no. And then kept typing. And I'm just like, man, whatever. Fuck you, dude. (laughs) So that was my last day at college. And then moved out, moved to another small little town and hung out with, you know, the same crew I did. And I skateboarded because that's what I did. I loved skateboarding, um, worked for a little skate shop and got sponsored by the same shop. You know, we'd enter competitions here and there. 
And, you know, that's what I had all my eggs in becoming a pro, yeah. which is stupid. Don't ever put all your eggs in one basket, kids. Always have a plan B, C, D, all that crap, because you never know what's going to happen. And it didn't happen. So here I am working, you know, little side jobs here and there. And then it was just you just felt lost for a little bit, not yeah. necessarily lost in life because, you know, you're still 20, 21 years old. You don't need to know what you're doing at that point. It's very normal. Yeah. It's very normal to be at that age and not know what the fuck you're going to do yeah. or at our age now and not know what the fuck we're going to do. I'm more comfortable you know now I mean? just going like. Hey, what's that? You know, somebody asked me, I'm like, I don't know. I've never thought about it. I don't know that I ever will. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so right around that point is when I was introduced to cocaine and I fucking loved it. I loved cocaine. It was just, it was, you could be hammered ass drunk. You do a line and you sober up. And you're right. just like you. You're not. You're not sober, but it's like you're not it, hammered ass drunk. Your anymore. mind shift. You're awake. Yeah. You're you went awake. from a downer to an upper. Yeah, you're awake now, and you just want to party and talk to people even more now. And it's just such a good time when you're at a party. It's still early. There's hella girls there, and you got a ball in your pocket. Right. You know, there was just that's that was like the best feeling in the world at the time. And, um, you know, did my whole thing in Hollywood where I swear cocaine's like smoking a cigarette in that town. It's just not frowned upon. Nobody cares. We'd be walking down the street and there'd be people we knew. Um, Hey, Mikey, try this. You know, he'd dab a little bit on his hand and I would sniff it off his hand, you know, on the streets of Hollywood and just go about our way. And even the people we hung out with were like, how long have you guys lived here? And we're just like, oh, just a few months. Why? They're like, how the fuck do you guys know everybody? It's like, dude, we just... I don't know. We're just the guy I lived with. We're very social people. And we lived at a restaurant to where everybody came to because it was very popular. It's not there anymore because even- You mean worked at? Worked at. What did I say? Lived. But no, I know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Worked at a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. And I I would get Coke for my managers. The managers at the restaurant would be like, Mikey, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, yeah. They're like, all right, here's a hundred bucks. Go get me, you know, whatever from him. And I'm just like, all right, I'm on the clock at this restaurant. Go out the side door run a couple blocks, grab the Coke sack for my boss from for my boss, give it to him and then go back to work. And we drank on the job all the time. It's Hollywood, babe. Nobody gives a fuck over there. And, but that's probably why the restaurant went under and Uh, why I'm not saying the restaurant's name. (laughs) Well, it it was the norm. It's, I mean, I don't live in Hollywood anymore, but I don't think much has changed. Yeah. It it became the norm with those in that group of individuals and how it was and what it was cycling through. Sure. Sure. So needless to say, um, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired and, uh, I had to get out of it. It was just very life in the fast lane, not to sound, you know, not to quote the Eagles or anything, but it was just, I was, like I said, sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I came back here and I got a good job, you know, with the County and stuff, and then just kind of slowed down. And I'm as what you guys call a normie with alcohol. Yeah. I can drink it or I cannot. It's really not a big deal. Yeah. I can have a couple drinks and I can stop. I can have a beer or a Jack and Coke with dinner, and then I'm good. Unlike you. Yeah. If you have some, you take it to another level. I've taken it to different levels. I've blacked out. I've woken up in places I've never... I've woken up in Glendale before without a shirt, sweating my ass off, wondering how the fuck I got to the valley from Hollywood. You know what I mean? Waking up with random women. Sorry, Mom. If you're listening to this, I know. If this is all <laughs> new, but you know, it is what it is. Um, so it was definitely... I don't regret any of it. Yeah. I feel like it's all a part of growing up. It's a process. It's a whole, you know, learning thing. But it just goes to show that I, you can have the best parents in the world and it's just yeah. inevitable, not inevitable. That's the wrong word. It's just, it's, it's possible. It's possible that these kind of stuff can happen. If you were looking at me while I was, even before Hollywood, if you were looking at me even a little bit after Hollywood, shit, um, you would just, you would think that, oh, this guy doesn't give a fuck about nothing. His parents probably didn't care, blah, blah, blah. My parents are great. Yeah. Like I said, I have nothing bad to say about them. They're awesome parents. But you just get wrapped up in certain shit and you just hit the ground running. Like, Jason can probably vouch for me. I have a very addictive personality. If I get one tattoo, I got to have sleeves covering <laughs> it. You know what I mean? And if I did coke, I wanted to do it all. And But luckily, that doesn't fall in for alcohol, though, yeah. which a lot of my family members are alcoholics. 
but they're from the old school as far as, you know, come home, that's have the a norm. drink. Yeah, that's their norm. Have a drink or six. Have a drink or six, exactly. And yeah. so, but I I didn't have that problem with alcohol. I really didn't. And, and I can God. honestly say that too. And, you know, some people, I've, I've heard some people say if you get drunk like once a month, or not even get drunk. If you have a drink once a month, you're an alcoholic. Yeah. I'm like, that's bullshit. That's not true. If I have one glass of wine a month, that yeah. does not make me an alcoholic. In my opinion, it's yeah. just my opinion. No, and there, there's people that it's just they, it, it doesn't cause any issues to their life. And I don't mean that like, oh, they wake up hungover and they still go to work and they do that five day. I mean, where it's just not an issue. And I was, a, I did have times like that where. The, 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 you know, we used to throw parties when I first moved to this area, like yeah. Super Bowl or something, and we had this nice apartment. And uh, p- you know, people, hey, bring stuff. Well, we'd have a fridge; almost our full fridge was full of beer. And eventually, we were just giving it away because it wasn't like an issue. But there was things that happened that all of a sudden the traumas started to get triggered more and more and more. And then I found my brain really mm-hmm. now looking at was trying to process all that shit. Yeah, you know, and. My parents are amazing people. Sure. They love and adore my brother and I to death. Yeah. They're phenomenal people, but they're people that came from traumas as well. And it and it rolled over. They sure. they met each other, you know, again, young age, very similar to kind of my story, you know. Um, and those things rolled over and over and over and that, yeah. you know, so so different from you. You know, yours is kind of just Socially, who you were hanging out with, what you're doing, young, dumb kind of thing. Whereas mm-hmm. mine was young, dumb kind of thing. But throughout all that, these traumas started to come out. The acting out started to come out. And so there was, for me, it, w- it went from the fun to needing to silence those voices right. of self hatred, uh, you know, not understanding that things happen to all of us as children. We, we don't have the defense mechanisms, or unfortunately at times, no matter how great your parents are, if my parents knew the shit that happened, uh, you know, like the one incident, there's no fucking way they would have let it happen. Sure. Uh, and my dad, the guys th- that it happened with, um, is dead now, mm-hmm. and I still will refuse to tell my parents who, mm-hmm. um, but how do you know, my dad would have been in jail for murder. Yeah. You know? Um, so, but those things happen. You know, for me, that was a lot of insecurities of wanting validation from females over all the years. Uh, you know, so now it's like trying to bring it back center. It's kind of a, it's a little bit of a motherfucker, you know. Cause- and it just goes to show, too, like just the different childhoods, even between you and I. It's like I never really felt like I needed validation from you say women, but it's like, I, I'm, I'm good. You know what I mean? Like I've always been very comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'll go get a fucking pedicure. Yeah. I don't care. You know I what I mean? I have purple toenails. Yeah. What are we talking about? I'll go get a fucking like pedicure and stuff like that. But it's just, I, the point of that is I've always been comfortable in my own skin. I've never really felt like I've needed to seek validation from anybody. I just, I don't, maybe that's parenting. Maybe that's just my personality based off of genetics. I don't know. I don't know. But, um, I do know that, you know, it, it, it is a motherfucker and I'm glad that, you know, I got out of Los Angeles when I did, because who knows what would have happened if I would have stayed there. I wasn't doing any, there's so many great things that you can do coming out of Los Angeles. I see some of my friends still there. Um, doing fucking great yeah and i just didn't really see that for me because i didn't really have any ambition there yeah it's cool to go to la and flirt with the idea of becoming like an actor or something like that but all i wanted to do is party and my roommate at the time bless his heart he would be like dude no not tonight i have fucking school tomorrow blah 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 and i'm just like man whatever it's funny (laughs) because i haven't talked about this in a while now i'm starting to think of all the times i remember walking down santa cruz with just (laughs) my pants my vans, no shirt on, and my buddy's sister's fur coat. That's all I had. <laughs> and I was walking with another friend of mine. We're all twacked out of our minds. And I'm thinking back now, looking like just, wow, what a fucking idiot. Yeah. But, you know, we came out of it. We're fine. We're uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, no, a lot of stupid incidents. <laughs> I remember one kid's mom, we're partying well before parenthood. And who, you know, I don't remember how it was. And she's like, you know, hold still, you know. And it's kind of like between that sober and and forgetting moment. Well, she had put makeup on me, full face. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'd kind of like come to, you know, because I was like eating or whatever. Then you kind of 
sober up a little bit. And then it's like, hey, we're, we're out of beer. All right, I'll walk and get more because we're like three blocks away from the convenience store. So here I am walking to the convenience store, full face of makeup. Boy, I look glamorous. Yeah, that but, explains the painted toenails now. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I always kind of, you know, and it goes back to like the, the influence, like you talk, like the Nikki Sixes and Tommy Lees and, you know, that were Motley Crue was like my childhood band. Yeah. And, you know, they had their nails painted, you know, so for prior to, parenthood i had all black nails rings so on every finger you know yeah. earrings when when guy liner was the rock star thing i went to concerts i had it i had you know i still do crazy different colored i i'm just i kind of look at life in an artistic way and i'm getting more comfortable that if i like it fuck it like yeah i i you know my parents haven't seen seen my ring nose in, in person if they got something to say it's Your like nose ring nose ring yeah ring nose what ring the fuck nose, yeah. uh who who cares it's like the conversation i had with my dad he's like you haven't got any more of those tattoos i go no nah, i can't afford it but if i could i'd look like a fucking lampshade yeah you know son i'm like don't even dad because guess what i don't approve of a lot of your life choices either but if it's the shit that allows me to express myself and my inner the things i like about me inside and put it on the outside and I'm comfortable with it, who the fuck is to sit and tell me not to do it? And I think that's the same with anyone in life. If your thing is to, you know, like fucking the the, the interview we had earlier this month, Catherine Hudson, an awesome lady, Mm -hmm. you know, to write sci-fi, then fucking do it. Who's anyone to tell you? And you want to be a success. Well, she became an international bestseller or, you know, any of them. Caitlyn Jenner, who's anyone to tell, you know? Caitlin felt this from an early age or whatever sure, it is, sure, you know, sure. or so I think a lot of people mask a lot of shit yeah. with, through alcohol and all that. And then I think that was me just masking it and trying to be something bigger. The story I built up in my head about myself <clears throat> that wasn't actually the case. And now I'm actually building myself up in reality. Yeah. And you know, it's funny too because I ended up going to rehab for cocaine and it's it was so crazy to me and I just I didn't that particular rehab just didn't sit with me well. They would come to me and they would be like, "So what's wrong, brother? Why why did you get into cocaine? Like what were you running from?" And I'm like, "Nothing. I wasn't running from anything. Have you ever done cocaine before? It's a <laughs> fucking blast." Now, granted it's killing you, literally yeah. killing you, but I would tell them that like my parents were and are great. My childhood wasn't bad. I skateboarded. I did okay in high school. Didn't really fuck with college, but still got I had full-time jobs. You know what I mean? I just did cocaine. It was just fun. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. And that sometimes that's all it takes. Luckily, I controlled it. There's a lot of people who couldn't Like, I could just stop it cold turkey. Mm -hmm. Drinking. I can go out, have a couple, get shit-faced, or just get... uh, Okay. I can go out, have a couple, or I can go out and get shit-faced and then not touch it again for a month or two months or three months. Which I've seen. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's just I have that control, and it's really unfortunate that some don't because you hear some horror stories and Mm -hmm. it it's awful and everybody that we've talked to everybody who listened who is going through stuff or overcame stuff like we appreciate you we appreciate you listening we appreciate you tuning in every week and all that stuff and if you're still going through it call us hit us up dm us we have numbers from multiple guests that we got where we need help um you know just keep fighting the good fight because mm-hmm. there is light at the end of the tunnel. We've seen people who like Novak, you heard his, I know we refer to him a lot, but he was just such a fucking awesome guest. You've seen what he's gone through in his life and all of his friends. Bam even told us there was no way I would have ever thought to see him get better. And he did. Yeah. So you can too. So moral of that story and that little rant was keep fighting the good fight. Cause you got this. And those who do got it under control and are sober now, Fuck yeah. Good for you. Yeah, hell yeah. And and uh, when you get to that point to uh, help others and pay it forward, that's what it's all about. That's what the knocking doors down is all about is taking our experiences, getting out there, speaking with people to hopefully pay it forward just to help one person at a time. And if it's making a difference, then this crazy journey that uh, started off a, 
<laughs> that's something that I th- thought was going to be a little bit smaller. It continues to grow and will continue to grow into the new year. And hopefully once, uh, you know, COVID things change and we'll be getting out there more, speaking with more people, being bringing people in, getting people out for speaking appearances. And who knows, man, sky's the limit. You know, we're not uh, limiting ourselves or our abilities in any way, shape or form. And also, too, before we wrap up, I also want to say as far as uh, substances and alcohol aside, um, any kind kind of anxiety, depression, all that crap. I feel you. I understand cuz I got it. We're all, yeah. you know, you know, panic we're all attacks. in this together, panic attacks. I got it. Hit up our Instagram page, shoot a DM. I will respond as fastly as I can. Um if you just need to vent, if you need you know, just somebody to talk to. If you need to feel like you need to be heard. We're here for you, so yeah. don't don't be afraid to shoot us a message. Yeah, and our social media, of course, we're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. They're all in the podcast description. We do respond to those as soon as we can, and uh, you know, we definitely want to. If we don't have the thing that that is helpful, we do know a lot of knowledgeable people we'll that we can connect. Does, yeah. uh, you know, everything from substance abuse, anxiety, depression. Uh, you know, suicidal thoughts, whatever it is, we can connect you with someone in some way, shape, or form that even if they're not the per- initial person that's going to be there helping you or treating you, that they can get you pointed in the right direction of, of what it can do because there's uh, it's nothing you can't recover from and turn around. Okay, and uh, as we do with all of our guests, yep. let's do it with each other. Let's do one rapid question each. I say two. Okay, fine, two. Jason, yeah. If somebody were to make a movie about you, who would play you and why? Ben Affleck. <laughs> uh, because, and I'll go back. I used to work in the Monterey Bay area at, at a place where tourists came through, and this this very sweet lady. Um, I'm guessing it was a Japanese tourist group, and she comes into the store I'm working in. She goes, "Oh, you're tall and handsome, like Ben Affleck," and I'm like. Fuck, that made my day because that's some is bitch is a good-looking dude. Yeah, he's a good-looking dude, but is he? Yeah, t- is he yeah oh, he's okay. tall. I'm like, wow. Uh, and I, I don't care what anyone says. I liked him as Batman. I've liked him in so many roles. I think he's a good actor, a good talent, and uh, I couldn't imagine a bigger honor, especially as someone who himself has gone through recovery and struggled, could yeah, really know and all. understand. Uh, so Ben Affleck, I'm a big fan. Um. Absolutely. No. The, no. No. I, my turn now. Let the record show. My Batman is Michael Keaton. <laughs> You're dick. Okay. Christian Bale. Uh. All right, Mikey. Um. Even though we brought them up before, just because they're amuse, amusing. Pet peeves. Give them to us. Oh, for fuck's sake. Um. What are some of my pet peeves? Chewing. Loud chewing. Um, people who don't signal when you, when it's necessary, if you're in a turning lane, I don't care if you signal, but if we're on a two lane road and you're going and I need to turn left and you need to go left signal left. So I can go left as well. Yeah. Yeah. If they're coming. Yeah. I hate that. Um, what else do I hate? I hate people that are in the fast lane going 55 miles an hour when the slow lane is wide open. I will not go around them. I will get on their tail to make my point. Um, I hate tailgaters. <laughs> I yeah, no shit. I know, right? That could be another one. Um, I, I hate tailgaters if I'm going like eighty yeah. and you're on my ass and I'm going eighty. I'm like, dude, I'm not going any faster than this. You can go around at that point. So I know that's kind of contradictory in what I just said, but fuck it. Um, what else do I hate? There's a lot of things, but being put on the spot, it's kind of hard to answer. Now I get what the guests are coming from. Yeah. Um, what else do I hate? Being interrupted. I hate it when I'm talking to somebody and I can tell that they're not listening. Sure. Um, I hate it when I'm talking to somebody and then they immediately go to like asking somebody else a random question or like getting sidetracked on their phone or something like that. Yeah. Pretty much all falls into that category of not being heard. That's the biggest yeah. pet peeve of mine. Um, those are like the main ones that I can think of. A lot to do with driving too. Yeah. Because I used to drive a lot before this job and that I noticed a lot of shit that yeah. would bug me. Uh, when it's raining outside, you don't need to go 20 miles an hour on the freeway. That only makes it more dangerous. Go with the flow of traffic, but keep a <laughs> safe distance. I do not tailgate when it's raining. Don't worry. Um, yeah. Driving advice from Mikey. Yeah. Okay. Know. Got another one for All you, right. Jason. Um, what is... Who would you want to have dinner with, dead or alive, famous or not? Go. Oh, that one's hard. Because you're narrowing me down to one. 
Because there's and there's so many famous people or people that have had noteworthy life's work, so to speak. And then there's my grandmas. So it's so fucking hard. <coughs> can I can I do two? Nope. Just one. Dick. So much for rapid. Yeah, I can't. <laughs> I can't do my my grandma because it's so hard because both of them were so so important to me. Um, oh hell! Um, I think because my son has made him so interesting to me, and I knew so little Nikola Tesla hmm, because okay. he was such an interesting and odd mind, and he did so many things, Edison, you dick, uh, that other people got credit for that he created, but he didn't do any of it for monetary wealth, notoriety. He did it because he was so interested in the betterment of, of human possibility. Right. Um, he was so fascinated by that. And he, really, if you dig into him a little bit more, at least the way I've interpreted things that I've read, you know, he he looked at technology and advancements as a way of bettering society, community, and for people to actually be able to create better bonds, connectivity, um, almost like the theme of, of, you know, I know you're not a Star Trek guy, but Star Trek, the whole reason Gene Roddenberry was to show such crazy diversity that it's out there. These alien worlds, these new things that we're going to encounter and we go into them with our best foot forward where monetary wealth and these other things, not that if you're wealthy, there's anything wrong with that because, you know, hey, we all work hard for what we got, mm -hmm. the vast majority of us. But the, the, this idea that the world was this big, um, awesome thing and you can come and you can leave an imprint, uh, you know, that I think people are lost on him. So Nikola Tesla, since I can't get both my grandmas, mm -hmm. you dick, because they were awesome. My grandmas... That were amazing, amazing women and influences on me, I, especially my mom's mom. Okay. So, all right, Mikey. You know what? I know you've thrown it out there. You can't use Pacino again. I want the same question. If you could have one person, and I'm going to be a dick because you wouldn't let me choose both my grandmas. You can't choose your grandma. I wouldn't, and I'll tell you why. Is because my grandma... Well, one of my gram grandmas, thank God, is still alive, still kicking. Um, the other, I wouldn't choose my grandma because we had closure. We had our talks. Mm. We have all those great memories that I'll never forget. So I'll see her again. But as for now, who would I have dinner with? Yeah. And I can't pick P De Niro or Pacino? No. Then. No, I, you cannot. Then I would Marky, pick. Why aren't you having dinner with me? Who would I pick? This dinner right here. This dinner. I would like to have dinner with Denzel Washington. I think right? he would be cool as fuck. I, he's just, he's dope. I can't think of any movies off the top of my head that he's done that weren't just fucking rad. Um, I think he would just be, he would be cool to sit down and shoot the shit with him and... Just have a good conversation. I agree. Yeah. I, I think, think he's Denzel a, Washington would be dope. I think he's a cool customer that he thrived in an area, a career field that definitely had, you know, an, a, a trajectory that was hard to get in an upward trend, but he's so talented and, and kind of got himself together to, to be able to do that. Yep. That's it. That's my All answer. All right, Mikey, as we say with any guest, any last uh, words of inspiration for anyone out there struggling on any level whatsoever? Like I said, um, you guys, you're not alone. You know, if we don't have the answers that you are seeking, we know the people who do. So don't feel, you know, shy or hesitant or afraid to reach out because we got you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if I can add anything is if you look in that mirror, sometimes that voice of negativity, it could be the voices of the past or whatever, and we, we all thrive to silence them. Look for new, innovative ways uh, to, to do it. The, you know, the anxiety, I've been working on breathing techniques. I take, uh, I'll do the 30-second cold shower is where I'm starting, where I'll switch over to ice cold right before I get out. Things that'll shock your system, getting physically active, challenging yourself with your diet, taking a look at those people, even if you care about them, are they toxic? Worst of all, look in the mirror. Are you the toxic individual? Are you that one in the environment that is that? Don't be willing to um, ever just sit there and 
rest in a total place of comfort. Of course, we all need some stability. We all need people we can trust and rely on. Most of all, we need to be trustworthy. We need to be reliable. And you can do it. There's not anything you can't really achieve if you're putting your mind to it, if you, you know, you're being realistic. Because I'll never be Hulk Hogan, but I sure as hell can be the best host of knocking doors down. So whatever it is you want to do, you can do it. Yes, sir. On that note, folks, hey, uh, if you're listening to this, you caught us uh, on uh, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Very Merry Christmas to you and yours. And uh, don't forget, next week, Mikey, who do we got for him on New Year's Eve? Ending the year with a bam, Mr. Bam Margera. Him and Brandon Novak will Novak will be making his second appearance on Knocking Doors Down, but we will have the very, very exciting, talented skateboarder, Mr. Bam Margera. And it's some funny shit, uh, but eye-opening too when it comes to addiction and as you get older and how you want your life to be different than your public perception for sure. All right, folks, keep Knocking Doors Down. The Knockin' Doors Down book shares all the history and inspiration behind the Carlos Vieira Foundation and how it all started. All proceeds from the book benefit the Carlos Vieira Foundation's Race to Be Drug-Free campaign. So what's that all about? Through the Race to Be Drug-Free campaign, Carlos Vieira Foundation raises awareness about drug abuse, donates to drug-free programs, and brings drug-free speakers into schools to educate youth. The Race to Be Drug-Free campaign's main program is the Gloves Not Drugs boxing program. This program is completely free for kids between the ages of 8 and 17 to learn discipline, strength, respect, camaraderie, and the art of boxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The program was created to keep kids off the streets, out of gangs, and away from drugs. For more info and to get involved, check out carlosvierafoundation.org. This podcast contains the views and opinions of the knocking doors down hosts and their guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is sharing their unique perspective, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. Privacy is of the utmost importance to us. For those wishing anonymity, people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality at the request of certain guests. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with their content establish a doctor-patient relationship. If you find any errors in any of the content of this podcast or blogs, please send a message through the contact page. This podcast is owned by KDD Media Company.